My name's Rich Divizio, and I played Baraka in Mortal Kombat 2. We were trying to come up with characters, you know, and, and we were going to costume stores and, and looking around and uh, found a mask of this uh, monster. Uh, there was this very tight mask that I had to wear. You know, painted it up, you know, kind of made it all, uh, butchered up his face. And I just remember tons and tons of water just coming down my neck. And we took like, uh, you know, fake nails and put them on for his teeth and uh, spray painted them silver. This mask was skin tight. And those made up his teeth. And so people don't realize that, you know, this really scary creature is made up of, you know, a mask and some fake uh, fingernails that were uh, bought in a, a supermarket. That shoe was unbelievable. Baraka hasn't been in many Mortal Kombat games, but he's been a fan favorite for a long time. Sector and Cyrax were unique in that um, they were mechanical and they were robotic. A funny story about Cyrax and, and Sector was that originally we could not think of a name for them. So Tony Gosky came up with the name Ketchup and Mustard. Ketchup being Sector and Mustard being Cyrax. Cyrax was um, one of the many characters portrayed by Sal DeVita. When Sal was playing Cyrax, I felt the worst for him because he had this helmet on that I remember him sweating a lot inside and he had just unbelievable tolerance for discomfort. The costume for Sector and Cyrax was really heavy. It was a lot of plastic armor and plastic chest plates, but then a custom-made helmet, but hot, uncomfortable, you know, couldn't breathe, couldn't hear anything. Uh, but somehow we made it through it. It was great. Cyrax always had a lot of cool moves, a lot of cool gadgets. His chest opens up and bombs come out, nets come out. In Deadly Alliance, he had one of my favorite fatalities with the big claw. Just, you know, slams the guy down. There were actually two Goro models made, um, and uh, one was used for the actual game and was kind of, it was posed and, you know, changed so much that it kind of fell apart over time. And I actually, I have one of the original Goro models that's stashed away at, at home. In 1992, Mortal Kombat changed the world of video gaming forever. The use of digitized actors, compelling characters, and gruesome graphic effects all helped to create a phenomena that took arcades by storm. A lot of people don't realize that the game was originally meant to be, you know, a quick project. I think if Mortal Kombat did not have any blood in it, it probably wouldn't have had the kind of success it did. 
fatality. Mortal Kombat 1 exceeded everybody's expectations. I don't think anybody was expecting it to be, you know, to become as big as it did. Ah! In 1993, Mortal Kombat 2 was unleashed upon a sea of bloodthirsty fans. More characters, more moves, more blood. All the fans of the first game had high expectations for the second one. You know, all eyes were on us, whereas before we kind of snuck up on everybody. But the fans would still not be satisfied. The 1995 saw the release of Mortal Kombat 3 with a diverse cast of characters, crisp graphics, and an intricate combo system. Reality's boring. Nobody wants to pay for reality. We take everything beyond reality to the point where it's, you know, the only way to do this is, is through our video game. Mortal Kombat was unstoppable. New technology made for broad advances in video games, and Mortal Kombat took full advantage. In 1998, Kombat, now in 3D, took on a whole new dimension. The Mortal Kombat 4 Road Tour is something that's never been done before in the video game world. I remember these big trucks driving around with Mortal Kombat 4 logo on them. MK4's release was again marked by controversy. It definitely wasn't the only game with that kind of violence and blood. There were games that actually surpassed it. It was just the only game that really was, you know, hugely popular and had the violence and blood. MK4 would be the last version of Mortal Kombat to be released in arcades, and fans eagerly awaited the series' next chapter on home systems. The fact that it sold in the millions was really kind of like a, you know, a bit of a, of an attestment to it. I guess it's staying power, I suppose. Feeding off the power of next generation systems, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance brought the franchise exclusively to home systems and expanded its mythology. This is easily the biggest production of all the Mortal Kombat games. You could take, you know, Take the work of three of the previous games, put them together, and you have uh, about what it took to, to make this game. We uh, really wanted to uh, make sure the martial arts was authentic in Deadly Alliance. In this game, we can make things look a little more real with the clavicles and neck bones that we didn't used to have in Mortal Kombat 4. The future for Mortal Kombat, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Now, waiting to be unleashed, Mortal Kombat Deception will deliver more of the carnage fans crave in 2004. Two years ago I was asked what the future of Mortal Kombat was, and at the time I don't think I really was sure what uh, Deception was going to be. Mortal Kombat Deception is by far the most ambitious Mortal Kombat we've ever done. Yeah, Ed had a master plan that, you know, okay, this is what we're going to do, guys. Laid it all out. Mortal Kombat Deception is probably different in what we are defining this game to be. Our goal was to really do something unexpected, and that's really along the lines of these different gameplay modes. In Deception, I'm most excited about how many old characters we're bringing back. We're bringing back characters that people have been asking for for quite a while now. <laughs> But I think all the characters actually look better than ever. We learned a lot in DA. But I think a really, really cool difference is the online experience. The online thing uh, brings back the arcade feel. This time you're playing against a real human being. I was part of the, uh, the first Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat 1. And back then and there was just four of us. You know, it was, it was four people that made Mortal Kombat 1 in less than a year. Now the team is just mammoth. It's necessary. Everybody on the team is needed. 
People have no idea how much effort goes into creating a video game in this day and age. The game now is so much deeper than, you know, back then. This game is about a bunch of guys beating each other up. And, a, and magic, and monsters, you know, and fun, excitement. I think deception is a, a good indication of what we're going to be doing with Mortal Kombat in the future. You know, it's kind of like the first step in many of expanding what Mortal Kombat means. Over the last decade, Mortal Kombat has become a legend in the arena of fighting games that will be here for years to come. Jade was the third in a series of characters that was derived from existing images. Jade was a female ninja type character like Melina and Katana were, and she was kind of like an evil version of, uh, of Katana in a sense. Jade is a uh, childhood friend of Katana, which probably makes her thousands of years old, because Katana is thousands of years old. The approach we've taken with Jade in this game, in Mortal Kombat Deception, is that she's more of the stealthy ninja type of character. She's the one that sneaks around and gets information, you know, and carries out covert activities. And uh, I kind of like that about her. She's about getting things done, and she's very loyal. We wanted to give her something that separated her from Katana Molina, so we gave her the staff weapon that was her weapon in Mortal Kombat 3. Not many characters had weapons in Mortal Kombat 3. That was really what we wanted to do to separate her from Katana Molina. John Parrish. I am Jack! Fatality. Being the big guy, I was using raw strength and mental attitude. Be uh, energetic, to be powerful, to actually portray myself as a hero, as I would look at it. John Parrish was great to work with. He was really one of the um, easiest guys to work with in terms of uh, being able to do all the moves and all of the special attacks. I am the real chance. We worked with him throughout Mortal Kombat 2 and Mortal Kombat 3, and he did a lot of promotional stuff with us. He was really great. When he first put the makeup on my arms, it took him six hours to do total. Actually, it feels great to be part of the Mortal Kombat legacy. Fatality. 
Johnny Cage wins. Fatality. Johnny Cage was kind of like our um, our version of a Hollywood action star. He's the, he's the one character not to take too seriously. He's not a brooding hero. He's a, you know, hey, kind of hero. You know, he's a Hollywood guy. You know, a lot of flair, a lot of pizzazz. Still very skilled martial artist, but put in the in the situation with all these noble Shaolin monks and Lin Kuei uh, ninjas. Johnny Cage, uh, to me, is almost like the comic relief of, of Mortal Kombat. He's the actor, so he, he doesn't take this all as seriously as a, a Liu Kang or a Raiden or Kung Lao will, will take it. Cabal first made his appearance in MK3. Uh, he was originally designed as kind of this nomad, you know, sand person kind of character. Again, we really wanted to create a character that seemed to have uh, a handicap of sorts in terms of like he had this breathing apparatus that kept him alive. He still had these incredible powers that none of the other characters had. He had a lot of cool moves. He had this dash, which uh, he would run past a character, spinning him around, and then he could pull off some combos on him. And everybody kind of liked this tornado move where he would run by the opponent and then they would spin like a top and kind of get a free hit on them. Cabal also had these hook sword weapons that one of the few characters in, in the 2D game that actually had a weapon in the game. So that kind of made him stand out. He was actually one of the characters that was considered almost too powerful in Mortal Kombat 3. And we had to kind of tone him down for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. For Deception, we finally had the chance to bring Cabal back the way we originally intended him to be. You know, we gave him the long trench coat gave him a backpack that was part of the original design, but back in the old days of digitizing, we couldn't really handle that. A long coat would have gotten in the way of uh, the character's moves. In the 2D games, we were really limited to the costumes that we could build because it was digitized graphics. And with the 3D games, we build the costumes and the computer so we can really do whatever we want. Cabal's always been one of my favorite characters, so I was totally happy to bring him back for Deception, give him the classic design that we intended. My name is Rich DiVizio. I played Kano in Mortal Kombat 1 and Mortal Kombat 3. We wanted to make a guy who was kind of half cyborg, half human, and so we put this kind of this metal plate on his face. Again, we bought something at a costume store and you know, put makeup on and, and attached it. And the guy who played Kano, this guy Rich DeVizio, he just, he brought it to a new level. He gave him his character. He just, you know, really became Kano in a sense. It becomes a part of me. When I played Kano, um, I actually felt that it was kind of a, a showcase for myself to become larger than life with this character. Oh! I really believe that, that I can be this guy, and it worked out very well. It's not hard for me to embrace a character and become it. One of the favorite moves that I like that Kano did was his fatality, and it goes a little something like this. <laughs> Kano wins!
I believe Kenshi's name in Japanese means sword saint. His storyline from his past is that he used to travel Japan and challenge experienced swordsmen and warriors just to defeat them so he could become the best in Japan. Eventually he lets his ego get the best of him and so Shang Tsung gets him to open up this tomb of Kenshi's ancestors which blinds Kenshi. Shang Tsung then absorbs these warrior souls and becomes stronger and he leaves Kenshi for dead. Kenshi then realizes what has just happened and now he's got a vendetta against Shang Tsung. His sword that he finds there in the tomb is actually his ancestor's sword. Fight! You would assume he's disabled because he doesn't have certain abilities, but then we compensated it by giving him other abilities, and that kind of makes him that much more interesting of a character. So he's one of the strongest characters in Deadly Alliance, and you wouldn't think so, having a character being blind. And she basically has the ability to propel his opponents in various directions. Lift him up over his head and slam him on the ground, propel him behind him, push them forward. So it's really like he's a, a very powerful distance player where you, um, you, know, you have the ability to attack your opponent even when you're at great distances. I think Katana was really one of the favorite characters from Mortal Kombat 2. I mean, it was, she was a new character. She had ridiculous combos that people, you know, came up with that I had not even thought of. And so when I saw people doing Katana combos, you know, in the corner, you knew there was something special because people were taking the game in a direction that you wouldn't even think of. Well, Katana um, was similar to Melina in that had a limited amount of memory than the Mortal Kombat 2 machine and we wanted to get 12 characters out so Katana and Melina are really kind of the female version of Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Katana wins. After the first Mortal Kombat, the creators wanted to introduce another Shaolin Monk type character. Uh, they had heard about me and I seemed uh, right for the part. Tony was probably one of the best martial artists that we worked with. You could see his, uh, his character, you know, the kicks are really high and they're authentic, so he lended a lot just because of all of his experience with martial arts. So in terms of his attitude, the way he moved, the tilt of the hat, all of that stemmed from what I thought Kung Lao should be. The favorite part of my personality uh, always stemmed from the hat. You put on the costume and you're still just a, you know, a person in costume, but once that hat goes on, it's almost like being Clint Eastwood in an old Western movie with the, with the brim of the hat hiding your eyes and when you slowly tilt that head up, you know once you make eye contact, that's Kung Lao. It's no longer Anthony Marquez, it's Kung Lao.
was created uh, because we needed to stretch the memory in our game again. We were out of memory, we had a cool female character in Katana, and we wanted to kind of double up on that and give her, you know, special moves, make, make an anti-Katana in a sense. And so that's kind of where Melina came from. And so then, with, the, with Melina, we had also introduced Baraka, so we wanted to make a tie with, with her because Baraka was a really bad character. So underneath the mask, Katana is really beautiful, and underneath Melina's mask is, you know, these really nasty teeth that were originally never on the costume, but we would just kind of draw them in on, on her fatalities. Melina. I think that Nightwolf is your quintessential Native American icon. Just a, a strong, proud uh, person with you know, pride. He's got honor, has rules, but at the same time, he is definitely no pushover. Well, the Nightwolf costume, um, looked a lot better on the drawing than I think it did on me, but um, you know, we made do. Nightwolf's fatality was holding his tomahawk up to the sky, channeling light into it, right into his enemy for his final blow. My favorite character that I played in Mortal Kombat was definitely Quan Chi. We do not fail! We have toyed with the ninja long enough. Quan Chi was a really interesting character because he was created for a game called Mortal Kombat Mythologies. You are responsible for this sorcerer! Which was a, an adventure game that was being uh, produced at the same time as we were doing Mortal Kombat 4. And so we thought it would be interesting to have him make an appearance in Mortal Kombat 4 as well as Mythologies, even though those two games happen in completely different parts of the Mortal Kombat timeline. Quan Chi is one of the most mystifying characters to me. We really don't know what his origins are other than he's from the Nether Realm and he's part of the Brotherhood of Shadow. Who knows how old he is? You know, he could be as old as the nether realm itself. But he is definitely evil. He is definitely an evil guy. I think of him as the greatest sorcerer in the Mortal Kombat universe. I think of him as being even more powerful than Shang Tsung. Rich Divizio was hilarious as Quan Chi. <laughs> uh, he really played the part well. To me, he is Kano, and he is also Quan Chi. He's, he's both of those characters. You can't look at Quan Chi and not think Rich. And now, on to Hollywood. The makeup was unbelievable, and I was actually able to act a little bit in full motion videos, which was very exciting for me. I remember that the impetus behind the cabinet design on MK4 was the reintroduction of the series back then. They wanted it to stand out in the midst of the arcades. As such, they wanted to push the sides as something that you could not miss. So he did some shots in the studio, had Rich come in, put fire behind him, big old Quan Chi face, no one could miss it. And that's what ended up happening. The first time I saw myself on the side of the Mortal Kombat 4 arcade stand-up, I was just blown away. That chapter in Mortal Kombat 4 was the Quan Chi show in a sense. Do not fail. seeing uh, myself in the game. Uh, I was ecstatic, 
Because I knew it was me. I thought it was just awesome. God of Thunder and Lightning, that just kind of became what his thing was. And I think that was really kind of what inspired a lot of his special moves was the fact that he was a god. Uh, in real life, I am a martial arts expert. I've been uh, doing various arts for probably 22 plus years. You know, I'm wearing this hat. <laughs> Got that on. Got that action working. Yeah, the hat is gone. It was it was destroyed with one of the falls that Carlos took, and um, I don't think we've seen it ever since. Do I have the hat? No, I wish I did. That's probably the one thing I wish I had. I feel really thankful to be part of the Mortal Kombat legacy, you know, and it's changed my life incredibly. Reptile actually was the character that I came up with driving back to work from lunch on a Saturday. We had seen how much we got away with in terms of Scorpion and Sub-Zero changing ninja palettes, and I, I really wanted another, a super secret hidden feature in, uh, in Mortal Kombat 1, and um, came up with these really odd set of circumstances to, to make uh, Reptile appear. It was rare enough that people would say that they had seen him and nobody would believe him, but so it worked out perfectly. I am Reptile. I talk like this. And then I have to go like this. Yeah, Reptile, uh, the infamous green man. It was uh, another one of those characters where they uh, swapped some of the images from one character to another. I saw those moves that they told me to do that were for other characters, like, for example, the force ball, you know, when I put my hands out and then a big ball comes rolling out. That was for Reptile, but here I had no clue at that time. Reptile wins. Fatality. Yeah, Scorpion's always been my favorite character, and he still is to this day. Fight! Playing Scorpion's cool. I mean, you get to be kind of just a little bit crazy, a little bit nuts. You know, it's like, a, you know, you're a ninja. How cool is that? I've played him in Sub-Zero Mythologies. I did some motion capture for Scorpion, and I played him during our, some of our live events for Mortal Kombat. I am Scorpion. You killed me in cold blood. As a player, if I get a chance, I'll always pick Scorpion. His whole play style, it just kind of suits my, my style of, of gameplay. I'm proud to have been part of the Scorpion legacy uh, throughout the years. The spear move has always been one of my favorite moves in uh, all the Mortal Kombat games, and I don't think we've ever been able to top it. Get over here! 
symbol of evil for Mortal Kombat. He's always around. I think he's been in almost every game. Excellent. His job in Mortal Kombat 1 was to win Earthrealm for Shao Kahn. Shang Tsung's stance I thought was really unusual, and it was kind of like this. Very different, very unique from all the rest of the characters in the game. Kung Lao, Johnny Cage, Reptile. Shao Kahn wanted to take over Earthrealm, and through the Mortal Kombat tournament, he was going to do it. Shang Tsung was probably one of my favorite characters in the series. He always kind of had the sinister edge, more so than some of the other characters. A bit more regal kind of feel, and that's what I tried to capitalize on in redesigning him for Deadly Alliance. In Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, Shang Tsung teams up with the sorcerer Quan Chi, and the both of them not only kill Liu Kang, but they kill Shao Kahn as well. <laughs> Shao Kahn was the big bad guy in Mortal Kombat. Feel the power of Shao Kahn. Well, Shao Kahn is kind of like the top of the ladder in terms of big bad guys in the Mortal Kombat series. Prepare to die. He was really the boss's boss in a sense, and he was basically the guy that everybody was ultimately trying to stop in terms of his invasion of Earth in uh, Mortal Kombat 3. And he also had this charge move that would attack you with. And a lot of players didn't realize that all you had to do was duck underneath the charge move and then you got a free uppercut. Once they discovered that, he became a lot more manageable of a character to fight against. But until they discovered that, he seemed almost undefeatable. Shao Kahn was killed in uh, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, but nobody really ever dies in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Place. It feels dark. As dark as every part that it has. Shujinko is kind of our next generation Liu Kang. Through the conquest mode, you uh, learn about Shujinko's past. He lives in the MK universe meets up with all the characters and eventually trains to become a warrior. It's kind of fun walking around, you know, and, and you know, you meet with Sub-Zero or an ancestor of Sub-Zero. I am Princess Kitana. If you are the champion of the Elder Gods, perhaps you can aid us in our struggle. When you finish it, you see him at age, you know, 60 or something like that, and that's when he is basically unlocked in the arcade game. <laughs> Shujinko wins! Everything from, you know, 20 year old Shujinko up to old man Shujinko um, is voiced by Max Crawford. Younger Shujinko is just a little variation of, of my actual voice. 
Good to see you again, Damashi. It was fun doing the old man. Oh, Master Boraijo, crack the dojo window. For Deception, our goal was to really say, let's bring back the nostalgic characters. And obviously, Sindel, Nightwolf, Baraka, Melina, all of those are in that category. And so we had to bring them back. Fight! The wig that we had in Mortal Kombat 3 for Sindel didn't have that much hair. We did a lot of After, after Effects touch-ups. She had this ability to scream at super loud volumes and that, that was kind of, that would stun the opponent and give you kind of a free hit. Sindel wins. Smoke originally came from our memory limitations that we've had in doing arcade games. And just as Scorpion and Sub-Zero were using the uh, same images and getting more mileage out of them by changing the color, when we were out of memory for Mortal Kombat 2, I always liked putting in the secret characters in the game at the last minute that nobody knows about. And that was kind of like the origin of Smoke and Jade. Where they were, you know, just kind of like the alternate colored versions of Sub-Zero and Melina and Katana. He had a lot of cool moves as a robot. He had this uh, grappling hook that would come out of his chest and uh, just had a lot of cool moves, which made him a uh, player favorite. We brought Smoke back for Deception just because people have been asking about him for a while now. It was funny because a lot of fans like the ninja version, a lot of fans like the robot version, so we thought it would be a good idea to bring back both. Every one of our characters in Deception has kind of two costumes, and so for, for Smoke we decided we were going to have him be a normal ninja like people had seen him before in Mortal Kombat 2, and then also his Mortal Kombat 3 persona, which is kind of like the cybernetic ninja. Players can pick which one they want to play as. Carrie was easily one of the best people we've worked with in terms of actors playing the characters. Yes, I still have the Sony costume. Every once in a while, I'll bring it out. I'll absolutely see Sonya again in future Mortal Kombat games. I would love to play Sonya again. My name is John Turk, and I am Sub-Zero. Fight! <laughs> 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 
you know, the, the freeze move in the first Mortal Kombat really came about because I was always a big fan of kind of setting up the player for a free hit. We walk over to the game and, you know, they're playing Mortal Kombat 3 and, you know, the kid's playing Sub-Zero and I'm standing right behind him and he doesn't even realize that the guy he's playing is right behind him. Let's get something straight. I am not a ninja. I am Lin Kuei. Scorpion was a ninja. My martial arts style defined the character of Sub-Zero's based on the way I move. The way I kick, the way I punch, the way I turn, the way I move my leg when I do sweeps. I guess not many people know that the, the Tanya character is named after um, my sister, who's named Tanya, and as well as my other sister's name is Sonia. Tanya is the daughter of an Adinian ambassador, but she has sided with the bad guys in previous games. She turned on Liu Kang in, in her ending in Mortal Kombat 4, that she, you know, sided with Shinnok. You know, and she sided with the Deadly Alliance even at one point. Now she's siding with the Dragon King. Not so much because she wanted to, but because she was almost forced into it. She's an enemy of Jade and Katana and Sindel, you know, because she's a traitor. She's a traitor to Adinia, she's a traitor to the realms, and she's, you know, not a good person. Tanya has always had her boomerang projectile move, which is one of the more outrageous uh, projectile moves in the game. And uh, we're giving her that boomerang move in Deception again. And in addition to that, she has a weapon, so she has a bigger arsenal of attacks than she did in the previous games. Let's finish him! <laughs> It was not by chance that this struggle came to be. The blame falls squarely upon my shoulders for giving evil the chance it needed, and therefore fulfilling an ancient prophecy. Raiden's Earthrealm champions had failed to stop the Deadly Alliance from fully resurrecting the mummified army of the Dragon King. In the end, only Raiden himself stood between Earthrealm and total destruction. Defying the Elder God's wishes, he alone challenged Quan Chi and Shang Tsung in mortal combat. Earthrealm's last hope for freedom. fought well against the two sorcerers, and it seemed as though victory was at hand. But the combined might of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung proved to be overwhelming, even for a Thunder God. Raiden was defeated. The Deadly Alliance had won.
Their victory was short-lived. As suspicion and lust for power overcame both Quan Chi and Shang Tsung, the former allies turned on each other. The deadly alliance was no more. She defeated Shang Tsung and reveled in his conquest. But it is said that there is only one true ruler of Outworld. And that ruler had returned. Sacrifice was in vain, for the blast had little effect on the Dragon King. Now Onaga has what he needs to shape the realms as he sees fit. I was the fool who brought him this power. Only I can destroy this threat, born of deception. Chojiao, or penetrating foot, is one of the oldest recorded styles of Kung Fu. The art is 30% fist and 70% kicking. Hands are used to protect, but it is the feet that always attack. 
Most of the northern Chinese arts have adopted Chou Jiao into their style. Choi Le Foot is a martial arts created by a famous Chinese man who named the art after the three masters who instructed him. A southern Chinese style composed of three different systems, as well as Lohan Qigong. Goju Ryu is one of the primary styles of Okinawa Karate. It was created by a famous Japanese martial artist who was influenced by his early sensei, a Nahate master, and a student of Shorinji and Chinese martial arts. He combined these styles into what is now called Goju Ryu Karate. Hua Chuan is one of the five long fist styles and can be viewed as a close-range martial art. Flower Fist has many wrestling and ground tactics, as well as hand and foot strikes, making it a well-rounded northern Chinese style. Mian Chuan, or Continuous Palm, is a martial art popular in Hebei province of China. The main philosophy is to be defensive, then offensive. Softness turns to hardness, thus giving the practitioner the upper hand in combat. This style was first presented to the general population during the 1936 Olympic Wushu demonstration. Monkey Fist, a martial art which movements are based on that of a monkey. The art was created by a famous Chinese martial artist who had been locked in prison and developed the style based on the movements of the monkeys he observed outside of his prison cell window. Mui Fa is one of the ten core handsets of Northern Shaolin Temple. Plum Flower utilizes all four directions for attacking and defending, as well as hidden chin techniques. Salat Pensak, or Pensak Salat, is an Indonesian-Malaysian martial art which dates from about the 4th century. The term Pensak Salat was first used in 1948 with the unification of many schools under one association. A close-in fighting art with many hand, foot, and elbow strikes. Faltudo is Portuguese for anything goes and is used to describe the no-holds-barred fighting competitions in Brazil and other South American countries. Hand strikes, kicks, throws, and grappling are all part of this style of fighting. Cha Chuan is a northern style of Kung Fu. It is a branch of Jiao Min or Muslim style Kung Fu and considered one of the five long fist styles, utilizing both hand and foot at the same time to execute its graceful and rhythmic movements. This is one of China's most famous long fist styles.
It was not by chance that this struggle came to be. The blame falls squarely upon my shoulders for giving evil the chance it needed, and therefore fulfilling an ancient prophecy. Raiden's Earthrealm champions had failed to stop the Deadly Alliance from fully resurrecting the mummified army of the Dragon King. In the end, only Raiden himself stood between the Earthrealm and total destruction. Defying the Elder God's wishes, he alone challenged Quan Chi and Shang Tsung in mortal combat, Earthrealm's last hope for freedom. <laughs> Raiden fought well against the two sorcerers, and it seemed as though victory was at hand. But the combined might of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung proved to be overwhelming, even for a Thunder God. The Deadly Alliance had won. The sorcerer's victory was short-lived, however. Once they realized that an alliance was no longer necessary, suspicion and lust for power overcame them. The former allies then turned their aggression on each other. Quan Chi defeated Shang Tsung and reveled in his conquest. But it is said that there is only one true ruler of Outworld. And that ruler had finally returned.
Onaga, former Emperor of Outworld. The Dragon King. No! It cannot be! The prophecy had been fulfilled. The Dragon King had indeed returned to Outworld to reclaim his army and impose his dominance. Death awaited all who stood in his way. And so it was that a new alliance was formed out of desperation. Mortal enemies joined forces to combat a greater threat. Raiden began to realize that even their combined might was not enough to beat the dragon. What are you doing? You don't want to know. There was only one chance left. Raiden's sacrifice was in vain, for the blast had little effect on the Dragon King. Now Onaga has what he needs to shape the realms as he sees fit. I was the fool who brought him this power. Only I can destroy this threat, born of deception. I am a freak. <laughs> <laughs> you are reality's only hope. I'll do it, Thunder God. Maybe because I don't... <laughs> you don't understand. I can't leave without the... <laughs> you see, Sub-Zero. <laughs> You can trust the sorcerer sometimes. Hold on, you guys got me now. Aha! A mortal with the ability to freeze. I forgot my line. You suck. A mortal. I mean, a keeper. <laughs> Sir, a mortal has escaped from the. <laughs> Sir, a mortal has escaped from the prison of souls. He is headed towards the gates of immortality. Sir! Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, she says it's sir. We have toyed with the ninja long. <laughs> Do not question. I oh, forget it. We have toyed with the ninja long enough. <laughs> Do not fail. We. You and I. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, me, everybody in this f***ing room. Oh, Master, in failing my mission, I have dishonored the Lin Kuei. An unfortunate event. Your incompetence will cost our clan dearly. Now you will pay with your life! Now, you will use this map on your next mission. Guan Chi has once again retained your services. 
this map you saw. It shows the way to a temple which predates man's recorded history on Earth. For thousands of years, the Temple of Elements has been hidden in what is now known as the Himalayan Mountains of Nepal. This map is the only evidence of its existence. Fine. I get to the temple, and then what? Dogs lick me. Because I wear clean underwear, and when I don't, it's usually quite brutal.